Warning, this film contains content that some viewers might find distressing. Viewer discretion is advised. I was called to duty with the state guard to help the state police control traffic and the crowds that began to show up at the armory to look for their loved ones. The smell of burned flesh from the bodies that were laid out on the drill shed floor permeated everything in the area. It was awful. Less than a year later, on Okinawa, the same smell was evident, with the Japanese troops that were scorched by flamethrower weapons, and I immediately thought of the circus fire. One never forgets that smell. I never went to the circuit's grounds that year, nor have I gone in the 63 years since. David Gibbons But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Greetings and welcome to Frozen Time. I'm Catherine of Sky, and here we relate moments in history that shape the people around them, events which are often dark, disturbing, and tragic. So if that's what you're into, you're in the right place. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, it's time to cozy in for a tale that you won't soon forget. The year of 1944 ushered in massive change for the world. In June, the D-Day invasion commenced, which marked the days until the end of World War II. Mahatma Gandhi was released from prison, in which he was held for encouraging Indian independence and civil uprisings against the British. Top songs of the year were Tura Lura Lura and Would You Like to Swing on a Star by Bing Crosby. The movies Meet Me in St. Louis and National Velvet also came out in 1944. And for perspective, the price of an 11 ounce package of Kellogg's Corn Flakes was 8 cents. Before we begin, I would like to direct your attention to CircusFire1944.com, a website completely dedicated to this event, created by Michael Skidgel. You'll see watermarks on a lot of the photos and they have been used with permission. It's an amazing resource with a massive collection of photographs and most interestingly, I think, personal stories from the survivors. I have included a few of them within this video, but if you are as fascinated as I am, leap on over to the website and read some more. The link is in the description below. I would also like to recommend Michael's book, The Hartford Circus Fire. It's written in language that's easy to read and helped me detangle some of the stuff I found on Wikipedia because of his persistent investigative journalism. It's a really interesting read and I highly recommend it if you want to look into more details on this tragic fire. His book is available on the website and you can even buy a signed copy. Pretty sweet. Since the turn of the century, the circus was a much hailed cause for celebration as the performers rolled into town. Remember that these were the days before internet, even television. Most people only had the radio to listen to or books to read for entertainment. Movies were popular, but nothing could beat the live action of seeing dazzling stars in exquisite costumes doing death-defying stunts, see real, live animals, which many of the folk in backwater towns would never have seen. Elephants, giraffes, and monkeys might have appeared to be quite alien and exotic to see in person in those times. In the mid-20th century, the typical circus would travel from town to town by train in cars marked with the circus name painted on their sides, stopping at convenient places to set up and perform for the entertainment-starved crowds. The largest circus in America was the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus, which touted the slogan, The Greatest Show on Earth. And it is this circus that set their tents in the fairgrounds of Hartford, Connecticut on the 6th of July, 1944. Keep in mind that because of the United States' participation in World War II, circuses had been experiencing shortages of personnel and equipment. Delays and malfunctions were frequently disrupting the ordinarily smooth running order of the circus. On July 5, 1944, the trains were so late that the earliest of the two shows scheduled for that day had to be cancelled. In circus superstition, missing a show is considered extremely bad luck. And while that is neither here nor there, since on this channel we don't do ghost stories or magical thinking, the circus folk would have been disturbed by this and at a high level of alert, half expecting an emergency or catastrophe. I guess considering what is to come, they probably would have thumbed their nose at my disbelief in their superstitions and said, we told you so. The next day was a Thursday and people from all around the city and surrounding towns were walking in through the front gates on Barber Street, 
including 11-year-old Arlene Hauschultz, who described the day as stiflingly hot. Her family planned on coming to the show the day before, the one that ended up being cancelled, so they were extra eager to see the show that started at 2.15 on that Thursday afternoon. As they walked in, Arlene noticed all the animals in the cages and felt sorry for them, on account of the day being so darn hot. She and her family made up a tiny fraction of the estimated 7,000 spectators in the audience. 7,000! That's the size of a small city! That's huge! Just think about putting together a temporary, portable, enclosed space large enough to hold 9,000 people, which was the maximum the Big Top could seat. The Big Top was the center of the circus where all the major shows took place. Inside this massive tent were arranged three rings where multiple acts could perform at once, each hoping to entertain a different segment of the audience so they would not become bored. There were also two additional stages with a 25-foot-wide oval-shaped track separating the performance area and the seating, which could either be bleachers or loose folding chairs. The track would allow performers to move to their assigned stages and also provided a means for an indoor parade, complete with clown cars, horses and performers in glittering costumes. The inside area measured 200 feet wide by 400 feet long, with 15 feet high sidewalls, and the roof was 48 feet high. That's the height of a four-story building. Quite an impressive sight to be seen. It was common practice to waterproof the tents by coating it with 1,800 pounds of paraffin wax dissolved in 6,000 US gallons of gasoline, a much-used waterproofing method of the time. After dissolving, they would sprinkle it on with watering cans and then spread it evenly with brooms as it became gelatinous. As horrifyingly dangerous as this sounds, some people claim that the super flammable gasoline vapors evaporated off within a few days, leaving just the wax. However, as we found out in our previous research of the 1961 Brazilian circus fire, that wax was also highly flammable, and you can probably see where this story is going. Gosh, this sounds awful, and you gotta know they weren't using any kind of safety equipment, no breathing masks to prevent fume inhalation, no goggles to keep splashes of gasoline away from the eyes. Jeez, the past was a very hazardous place to live in. The big top tent had been erected over freshly mowed grass and exposed dirt that had been watered down and then covered with hay and wood shavings. Gosh, that sounds super safe. The tent had a main entrance and eight other smaller exits, however many of the alternative exits were blocked by circus wagons or other items, like the cage-like metal chutes through which animals could enter the arena. After the lions performed, the great Walendas, who were known for their pyramids while cycling on the high wire, started their performance. It was circus band leader Merle Evans that first spotted the flames and immediately directed the band to play The Stars and Stripes Forever, a musical composition that traditionally signaled distress to all circus personnel. Arlene looked across from where she was sitting and saw a spot of fire and said, quote, most people thought it was small and that they'd put it out. Of course, Arlene had the presence of mind to want to leave as fast as possible, but her sister stopped her from trying to get out the way they came, since it was likely they would end up in a life-threatening crush. Shirley's husband was a firefighter and instructed her to always look for alternative exits, so instead of walking down the bleachers like most everyone else, they climbed to the top instead, hoping to jump off the back and sneak under the wall of the tent. But instead, the bleachers leveled out with some animal cages, and they were able to climb over these to escape the tent. These same cages prevented many others who were on ground level from leaving. Ringmaster Fred Bradna and the ushers unsuccessfully tried to maintain some order as the panicked crowd fled the big top. The ushers also worked to attempt to douse the fire with water jugs that had been stationed in the big top, and to pull down the canvas sections that were on fire. But after realizing their attempts were futile, they began to help evacuate the crowds. Yeah, with the roof being coated with flammable paraffin, that fire was destined to spread across the roof fast. There would have been no hope of segregating it to separate segments. The only animals in the tent at the time were the big cats that had just finished performing when the fire started. They were herded through the chutes leading from the performing cages to several cage wagons and were unharmed except for a few minor burns. I'm so relieved to hear that since I have a great empathy and compassion for animals of all kinds. 
Though most spectators were able to escape the fire, many people became hysterical, running around in circles trying to find their loved ones rather than trying to escape from the burning tent. Some people escaped but ran back inside to look for family members. That must have been terrifying, literally terror-inducing. We know that the power went out, so the tent would have been dark, lit only by the blazing fire overhead, but also choked with smoke, super hot both with the heat of the day and the fire burning, hot wax dripping down, burning any exposed skin. It must have been true hysteria or insanity because you couldn't logically expect to find your relatives amongst thousands in such conditions. Some stayed in their seats until it was too late, assuming that the fire would be put out promptly. At least two of the exits were blocked by animal chutes and people trying to escape could not bypass them, leading to people getting stuck and rained on by the fiery canvas. Survivor Maureen Creekian was 11 at the time of the fire. She said, quote, I remember somebody yelling and seeing a big ball of fire near the top of the tent. And this ball of fire just got bigger and bigger and bigger. By that time, everyone was panicking. The exit was blocked with the cages that the animals were brought in and out with, and there was a man taking kids and flinging them up and over that cage to get them out. I was sitting up in the bleachers and jumped down. I was three quarters of the way up. You jumped down and it was all straw underneath. There was a young man, a kid, and he had a pocket knife, and he slit the tent, took my arm, and pulled me out. As she was being pulled out, Creakian grabbed another little girl's arm and pulled her out as well. Frida Pushnik, who performed with the circus as the armless and legless wonder, was rescued by a minstrel show performer who rushed on stage, picked up Pushnik's chair and carried her to safety. Despite the terrifying event, she continued to perform with the circus until 1955. Many people were badly burned by the melting paraffin, which rained down from the roof. The fiery tent collapsed in about four minutes, according to eyewitness survivors, trapping hundreds of spectators beneath it. The burning and dripping paraffin caused serious burns, leading to further damage and infection. A picture appeared in several newspapers of sad tramp clown Emmett Kelly holding a water bucket, and it was so poignant that the event became known as, quote, the day the clowns cried. In choosing photographs from the event, I came across this one, which at first I thought must be part of a collage, but then I saw the supplied caption indicating it was an unaltered photo. It's quite eerie and unsettling to see that woman completely unfazed, standing in front of a massive 48-foot, 14-meter high building that is engulfed in flames. It's just the tiniest bit creepy. While many people burned to death, others died as a result of the ensuing chaos. Sources indicated that between 167 and 169 people died as a result of the fire, plus three others who died with the fire materially contributing to their poor health, with official injury estimates running over 700 people. And when they say, quote, burned to death, they don't mean most victims of fire die from asphyxiation due to smoke inhalation. These people were burned by the flames, their whole bodies blackened and charred like a horrific barbecue. I've seen some of the uncensored photos of the dead, which I will not be showing in this video, and I can only imagine they suffered the worst kind of agony as they perished. The number of actual injuries is believed to be higher than those figures, since many people were seen that day heading home in shock without seeking treatment in the city. Yeah, you can imagine that some people just go into sort of a trance with survival mechanisms kicking in, gotta head home to the nest of safety and comfort. As long as they could reasonably care for their minor injuries, they'd be okay. It's commonly believed that the number of fatalities is higher than the estimates given due to poorly kept residency records in rural towns and the fact that some smaller remains were never identified or claimed. There were also some drifters and other people who didn't appear in town records who never were reported missing, who perhaps got some of the free tickets that were handed out by local shops. Some died from injuries sustained after leaping from the tops of the bleachers, which one witness estimated at 25 feet, 7.6 meters high, in hopes that they could escape under the sides of the tent, though that method of escape ended up killing more than it saved. 
I couldn't find any actual numbers to back up that last claim on Wikipedia, and while it is certain that people died since the fall was extremely high, there are many survivors who mention they escaped that way, usually aided by someone on the ground who could catch them as they jumped or by sliding down nearby ropes. Looking at these bleachers, I'm kind of wondering how people sat down on them, as there doesn't seem to be a separate walking board. Did they just walk on the seats underneath, sit down, and let their legs dangle in empty space? Seems quite a dangerous sitting arrangement, and I wouldn't be surprised if people fell through frequently. Others died after being trampled by other spectators, with some smothered underneath piles of people who fell on top of them. If you aren't familiar with crushing, it is an extremely serious deadly force by which people push together so closely that they literally squeeze the breath out of the people in between. And if they fall, they are literally stepped on and their bodies crushed under the feet of dozens of people, resulting in an agonizing death. Most of the dead were found in piles, some three bodies deep at the most congested exits. A few people were found alive at the bottoms of these piles, protected by the bodies on top of them when the burning big top ultimately fell down. Those who survived carried the trauma for decades. 70 years after the fire, Carol Tillman Parrish, who was six at the time, said, quote, Until this day, I can smell the stench of human flesh as the blaze consumed its victims. The dead were carried in army trucks to the state armory morgue to be laid out for identification, which brings us back to the quote that introduced this episode. In reading Michael Skidgel's book in the Those Who Died chapter, it was absolutely harrowing seeing how badly hurt people were, some having bones broken in multiple places as they tried to escape the tent in the crowds, many burnt beyond recognition, needing to be identified by the jewelry, watch, or shoes they were wearing. As people waited in line to identify their loved ones at the morgue, they were warned with multiple signs about the odor of decay and the stench of the burned victims. For some, it was too much to take in, and some people fainted inside or became woozy and had to be helped out by nurses and other caregivers. That must have been absolutely horrible. These days, we think it's bad to go to an antiseptic and cold morgue where there is little, if any, scent. But this must have been absolutely horrific. It's bad enough dealing with the reality that your loved one has died, but to experience the awful stench, it's probably really hot in there as well, which is encouraging decomposition and the vomit-inducing odors of rot. It's so awful that everyone there had to experience that, and oh my goodness, there are so many bodies in there. The best-known victim of the circus fire was a young blonde girl wearing a white flowered dress. She's only known as Little Miss, 1565, named after the number assigned to her body at the city's makeshift morgue. Her face has become the most familiar image of the fire. Aw, oh, she looks so sweet and precious. It's so sad to think that her identity is still not known to 100% certainty. I find it so charming and endearing that they called her Little Miss instead of Female Child, as we would today. It really humanizes her. Her true identity has been the topic of debate and frustration in the Hartford area since the fire happened. She was initially buried without a name in Hartford's Northwood Cemetery, where a victim's memorial also stands. At the morgue, two police officers photographed her and took fingerprints, footprints, and dental charts to help identify her in the future. Despite massive publicity and repeated displays of her photograph in nationwide magazines, she was never claimed. In 1981, police investigator Lowe's widow announced that her husband had identified the child before he died, and she contacted her family, but they had requested no publicity. In 1987, someone left a note on the 1565 gravestone reading, quote, Sarah Graham is her name, 7638 DOB, six years, twin. Notes on nearby gravestones indicated that her twin brother and other relatives were buried close by. In 1991, the body was declared to be that of eight-year-old Eleanor Emily Cook, even though Cook's aunt and uncle had examined Little Miss 1565's body multiple times and said that it was not her. The Connecticut State Police Forensics Unit compared hair samples from the body and Eleanor's hairbrush and determined they were probably from the same person. The body was exhumed in 1991 and buried next to Emily's brother Edward, who had also died in the fire. Eleanor Cook's brother Donald Cook had contacted authorities in 1955 insisting that the girl was his sister. 
but was it her? Fire chronicler Stuart Onan points to the fact that Little Miss 1565 had blonde hair, while Eleanor Cook was a brunette. The shape of Little Miss 1565's face and that of Eleanor Cook are dissimilar, and the heights and ages of the two girls do not match, Eleanor being eight years old and Little Miss being only six. Their dental records also do not match, Eleanor having eight permanent teeth and Little Miss 1565 having only two. Their clothing was also completely different. Eleanor having gone to the circus in a red and blue plaid play suit, red socks and white summer shoes, whereas the little miss was wearing a white floral dress and brown shoes. Perhaps most significantly, when shown a photograph of little miss 1565, Eleanor's mother, Mildred Corinthia Parsons Cook, immediately stated that it was not her daughter. She firmly maintained that stance until her death in 1997, age 91. Mrs. Cook had been badly injured in the fire and unable to claim her two dead children. She was too emotionally traumatized to pursue it later. She believed that Eleanor was one of the two children who had been burned beyond recognition and remained unidentified. The most likely scenario is that a family mistakenly identified and claimed the body of the real Eleanor Cook as their own child, and she is buried under that child's name. Even when Little Miss 1565's picture ran in the papers, the family failed to recognize her as their own because they believed they'd already buried their child and wanted to move past the tragedy. Even though for many her identity is still in question, in 1992 the police investigators officially changed her death certificate from the previous identification of 1565 to Eleanor Cook. Since then the Cook family has raised questions about whether the body is indeed that of Eleanor Cook. I feel like the police here have really dropped the ball, and they must have been getting bonuses for knocking out cold cases or something. There are so many details that even we as lay people can see do not match. How on earth could they declare Little Miss 1565 to be Eleanor Cook? It just doesn't even make sense. Granted, we may never know the answer to who she was and will have to live with an enduring mystery, but don't ignore facts and change the girl's death certificate and gravestone. By chance, I found one other tantalizing story about the identity of this little miss from the personal accounts section of the CircusFire1944.com website. Note that these aren't verified or anything, so they could be random internet stories, but if it's true, it's just heartbreaking. Quote, in 1944, my dad was in the Connecticut State Police Academy, class of 44. After the academy, his first assignment was to help clean up after the circus fire. During those days at the fire scene and armory, he would come home at night and burn his clothes behind the garage every day, for obvious reasons. I remember him telling me about a little girl who they had in the armory for identification. She was badly burned. A man came in looking for his daughter, who was of the same general age and description. He said when the man saw the little girl, he shook his head and said, No, that isn't her. He said that from observing the man's reaction, he thought it was just that the man could not admit that it might have been his daughter. I have always wondered if this might have been the unidentified little girl who became known as Little Miss 1565. Dad passed away in 1986, and I'm sure he would have been glad to tell what he remembered. The memory of the man that viewed the little girl and denied her was very clear in his mind. He too was of the opinion that it was his little girl and he could not bring himself to say so. Warren Thompson The cause of the fire was never conclusively determined. At some point an arsonist was suspected when in 1950, Robert Dale Seiji brazenly confessed to the fire, claiming that he had a dream of an American Indian riding on a quote, flaming horse who told him to set fire to the circus. He illustrated this character when he was in prison, serving time for other arson convictions. He later recanted this confession. By the way, my guess at the pronunciation of his name would be Sigi, but in the interview, one of the officers called him Sigi, so I will continue with that. While Sigi was examined in a mental hospital, it was determined that he was of below normal intelligence levels and he was certainly capable of starting fires and a danger to society. This no doubt encouraged by the abuse he suffered as a child when his father beat him and burnt him as punishment. He served many years for arson, but he was out of jail in March 1993 when investigators decided to re-interview him to conclusively determine the truth. Almost 50 years after the event, 
His recollection of that day was that he had finished his work setting spotlights for the show and went to see a movie in Hartford. As he was riding back to the circus grounds on a bus, he heard people talking about the circus being on fire, and when he arrived, it had already burned to the ground. He said that his confession to Ohio police in 1950 had been coerced during a vigorous interrogation, and he felt like the Ohio investigators and doctors had brainwashed him. C.G. felt that they did not like him because of his American Indian heritage. Quote, C.G. also admitted that he struggled to separate his two realities, one as a white man and one as Chief Black Raven, a shaman, and that he wanted to make peace with the spirit Wonka Tonka. Telling the truth would bring him peace, and he insisted repeatedly during the interviews that he did not start the circus fire. He felt like a failure that day for leaving the grounds and not being there to help. C.G. told them there were many disgruntled circus employees who hadn't been paid, and someone might have started the fire with a magnifying glass. It was apparent that the prime time to interview C.G. as a suspect in the circus fire had long passed. Detective Lewis and Sergeant Butterworth didn't feel they gained any additional useful information about the cause and origin of the fire. From the Hartford Circus Fire by Michael Skidgel. I listened to the entire interview myself, and it was bizarre, to say the least. It is quite apparent that he's not the sharpest knife in the box. The strangest part to me was that he kept rambling on and repeating that he was telling them the truth, and that he wanted them to, quote, use their judgment and believe what he was saying. To me, it felt very much like he was protesting too much, as Shakespeare would phrase it. There is a moment where he becomes quite directed and emotional when he talks about how he felt about the fire. I'll quote this conversation with Detective Lewis. What did and you do you, then? I felt an awful guilt sensation. I should have burned up to that fire with his people. Why do you say that? Because I thought that I was a soldier who had left his post and left it to the enemy. In that case, the enemy was the fire. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people lost their life because I left my post. Do you think you could have prevented the fire? Oh, no. But I could have died with them. And what would that have proved? That I didn't leave my post. Know it in your heart and your mind and soul that you couldn't have prevented anything. But still, you're a warrior. Mm -hmm. And you feel that you have deserted your post. You would have rather die than desert your post. You understand? Yes, I do. I would have rather died at that fire that day than to feel like I did after. And yet there was no reason for such guilt. That day he was given the afternoon off. He wasn't meant to be working in the tent at all. I found this to be very strange since he had also talked in the interview about being in the army, traveling overseas, but it just, quote, didn't work out because his shamanic reality and the white man reality didn't quite work together. And he left the army after a year under a code which meant unsuitability to army life. And yet he didn't remark that that was a betrayal in any way. If one thinks he was culpable of starting the fire, it seems he might have regretted it to the point of wishing he was dead, dying with the others he sentenced to death. I have linked the interview at that timestamp in the description if you want to listen to the whole thing yourself. Of course, it is likely that we will never know. He died about four years after the interview was recorded. At one point, he said that in his branch of Indian or Native American culture, if they knew he had started the fire, they would tie him to a stake and burn him alive. Was he unwilling to admit his guilt because he thought that might come to pass? In 1944, there was an important observation made by a Mrs. Menard, an educated school teacher who worked with the Red Cross Motor Corps, who arrived at Municipal Hospital after the fire. She encountered a man called Harry Lakin, and he asked her to hold his hand, and as she did this, he began to say some pretty peculiar things. He said he was an electrician with the circus and that he worked the spotlights, the same as Robert C.G. did. He exclaimed to her, I'm not squealing, and began to cry. Mrs. Menard stated that he also said, quote, I never knew it would be like this, and something like, quote, I don't know that I can take it. 
His injuries were not severe, so it's not likely he would be complaining about that. Harry Lewis Lakin Jr. was 28 years old and was from the same hometown of Portland, Maine as C.G. was. In fact, this is where C.G. ran away from home and joined up with the circus just four to five days before the fire happened. Could C.G. have been the one that Lakin wouldn't squeal on? For the non-native English speakers out there, squeal is an old-fashioned term which means outing someone or informing against another person. For example, one member of a bank heist squealing on others to get a lighter prison sentence. Was it possible that Lakin had seen the fire started? They might have been in on it together, figuring that it would be put out by the seatman, whose job it was to go around the tent extinguishing cigarette butts and other small fires underneath the bleachers. But two seatmen were out of position that day, and so the fire was not noticed in time and became the blazing inferno that killed so many. Remember that C.G. was only 14 years old at the time, so he might have done it as a prank, a theory that fits neatly with Mr. Lakin's exclamations as well as C.G.'s mournful words in the interview about being able to prevent the fire. Yes, instead of looking for evidence and developing a theory on that, it appears that the police made up their mind on what happened and only looked for evidence that supported their conclusion. Not a good look on the police department at that time. Uh, the 1993 investigators also wanted to review the possibility of a cigarette igniting grass, something that had been proposed right after the fire. The idea was that since the fire started either in or behind the men's toilet enclosure, a mini tent which was abutting the big top, that it might have been caused by a carelessly flicked cigarette or match landing in the dried grass that lined the floor, slowly consuming the tinder and developing into a flame that then licked up the big top sidewall. Testing determined that a cigarette alone would not set the grass on fire. The experiments showed charring and smoke, but a full-fledged fire was not achieved. This agreed with the report made in 1945 by Commissioner Hickey. In any case, both teams of investigators believed that the fire was accidental and not likely arson. In June 1993, the reinvestigation case was officially closed. The team's conclusion was that the fire originated inside or just outside the men's toilet enclosure between the smaller tent and the big top. A discarded cigarette was ruled out, but it was impossible to rule out all possible accidental causes, such as a lit match being thrown onto the grass or accidentally landing in a fold of the tent fabric. Otherwise, there was no indication of arson at all, no accelerant was found, etc. Robert C.G. had denied involvement, so the cause of the fire was listed as, quote, undetermined. Meanwhile, back in 1944, the legal system was shifting into high gear. After interviewing scores of witnesses, they discovered several things of note. Jersey Foster, a circus employee, was making his rounds when he saw the fire on top of the tent. He and others sliced the sidewall canvas and made impromptu slides, urging spectators to jump and slide to safety from the top row of the South Grandstand, preventing serious injury from jumping down. In addition to burns and smoke inhalation, victims suffered a wide variety of injuries, including friction burns from sliding down ropes and poles, fractures, sprains and strains, contusions, and emotional distress. Dozens of Ringling employees were injured, fortunately none of them seriously, and no one was killed. And most received treatment from the circus's traveling doctor rather than the Hartford hospitals. Because of the public scorn for the circus, few felt welcome outside the circus grounds. Ringling usher Kenneth Gwinnell testified that the only logical cause of the fire was a thrown match or cigarette, and his co-worker Todd stated that he had put out dozens of fires under the seats this season alone. The commissioner's report was especially critical of the circus for its lack of fire prevention equipment, insufficient personnel to handle an emergency, allowing the exits to be blocked by the animal runways, and failure to replace the seatmen on fire watch with replacements when they were called on for other duties. On July 7, 1944, charges of involuntary manslaughter were filed against five officials and employees of Ringling Brothers. The circus agreed to accept full financial responsibility and pay whatever amount the city requested in damages. The circus paid almost $5 million to the 600 victims and families who had filed claims against them by 1954, 10 years after the disaster. All circus profits from the time of the fire until then had been set aside to pay off those claims. 
The circus's defendants pleaded no contest to the charges of involuntary manslaughter against them, basically admitting guilt, believing that any sentences imposed on them would be suspended, considering that Ringling had accepted responsibility for the restitution to the victims and those who suffered. Sentences were imposed on the circus men in February 1945, and all but one was stayed until April to allow the circus to travel to its next stop to help the company set up at the next location after the disaster. I gotta say, that seems quite generous of the judicial system. I doubt they would do that nowadays. In March 1945, Ringling attorneys sought a suspension for the sentences of those charged, but Judge William J. Shea denied their motion to suspend the sentences, but he did reduce them. After they all served the minimum of about a year, they got out early for good behavior. Personal accounts. These all come from the CircusFire1944.com website. Quote, I survived the circus fire thanks to probably the same good Samaritan that lifted Father Payne over the animal cage tunnel. He lifted me over also and I was able to escape. I was told later that he was a reporter from the Hartford Times and that, after helping literally hundreds to safety over that barrier, he died in the fire. I was 12 at the time and I had gone to the circus with our neighbors. David M. Elevitz, P.E. Quote, I went to the circus with my mother, Mary Hindle, and my grandmother, Ada Hall Hindle. Ada was supposed to go back home to Norwich, Connecticut, and stayed, but stayed. Quote, I went to the circus with my mother, Mary Hindle, and my grandmother, Ada Hall Hindle. Ada was supposed to go home to Norwich, Connecticut, but stayed an extra day to take me to the circus. She turned out to be a victim. I was six years old, and I will never forget that day or the days that followed. We were watching the trapeze act and the lion and tigers who were in the center ring when the fire broke out. The wild animals were rushed out so the array of cages could be removed. The trapeze group were down on the ground very quickly. People started going down the bleachers throwing chairs left and right as they went. When I got my leg caught and someone fell on me, my mother had turned around and grabbed and pulled me to safety. We had lost track of Ada who was taken to the hospital. My mother and I made it to the street and tried to get on a bus. A police officer directed us to an ambulance which took us to a hospital. The heat inside the tent was so severe that although we were not exposed to flames, we were burnt over our body. Edmund Hall Hindle Quote, I was at the fire with my wife, mother, and dad. I was home while waiting to go on duty in the Navy. We had reserved seats high at the end of the bandstand. Clyde Beatty's Animal Act was on in front of us. The fire started off to the left. As people panicked, Dad and I made the women sit still. When the aisle cleared, we walked down it and out the nearest exit. The band was still playing. When I turned to make sure Mother and Dad were with us, I saw the tent collapse. In 1949, I took my six-year-old daughter to the circus in Wilmington, Delaware. When I requested two seats in the top row, the ticket seller asked why I wanted such less desirable seats. I told him, quote, I was at Hartford. This created quite a stir. Dave Carnell. Quote, while I was only four years old at the time, I remember sitting in the bleachers in the big top and my mom saying, oh my God, we must get out of here. I looked up and saw pieces of the tent falling in. With my hand in my mom's, she pulled me through the crowds and outside. I remember being pulled over ditches, animals being herded in all directions, people screaming and witnessing total panic all around me. Denny Brooke. Quote, my father took my sister and I to watch the circus set up the tents the day before. I was five, my sister Eileen three. You can't understand how exciting that was today in an age of TV and internet. The show itself couldn't come fast enough. When the fire broke out, dad put me on his back and leapfrogged chairs. At the stairs over the animal chutes in a crazed crowd, dad slipped and fell with me. A man assisting folks in trouble picked us both up and threw us over the chute to safety. As I hit the ground, I remember looking back and seeing a big flaming tent pole come crashing down not far from where we had just left. Over the years, I've always wondered whether that man survived, because I probably owe him my life. We got up and continued out the rear entrance, then making our way around to the front looking for family. 
My sister and cousin Jerome were thrown down from the top of the stance and successfully caught. Vincent was allowed to forge ahead of everyone because my mom and aunts thought he was grown up enough to get out on his own. No one could guess how vicious the fight for survival would be. My cousin Jerome once told me he had his arm get caught somehow in the animal chute and how he pried it loose just in time. And of course, we know now how dangerous a location that was to have a problem in. As we fled the tent, in all my boyhood naivete, I remember begging my father to let me go to a firebox and sound the alarm, this with fire engines already pulling up outside. In front, a gruesome scene of blackened, smoking bodies on the grass was already unfolding. After a few minutes, police forced us out of the area. In a short while, we found my mother lying on an overgrown lot, crying hysterically. Everyone's okay, but we can't find Vincent, she wailed. Later that evening, we would find out that my first cousin Vincent had been trampled to death. He was such a lovely boy. Sometimes he'd bend over so I could climb onto his back for the walk to a school. Other times he'd sing duets with my mother. Would you want to wish on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar? A popular Bing Crosby song of the time. The entire family, led by my Italian grandmother Lillian, immediately went into mourning. There was no consoling my aunt and uncle, Vincent's parents. In the weeks and months to follow, Laura, his mom, almost had a nervous breakdown, still looking out her front window and expecting her only child to come running in from school. Even though I was barely six years old, the events of that day and afterward are seared forever in my memory. How could it not be? It was absolutely horrifying. Fifteen years later, while serving in the U.S. Air Force, I experienced the only other large-scale fire of my life. I never want to see a third. I was in a World War II hangar on work detail when it caught fire and burned to the ground in ten minutes flat. An airman was swabbing the floor down with high-octane airplane gas, and it ignited when he went to hose it down. Just the friction from trying to screw a hose to a faucet supplied the spark. Suddenly, I heard a huge sucking sound, oxygen being sucked, and 75 feet away, the airman racing ahead of a wall of flames, his brogans afire. We shot out the back door. Thank God everyone got out alive. The reason I bring this up is, I have a memory of a terrible sucking sound like that at the circus fire as the fire advanced across the big top. Has any other survivor ever mentioned it? I've never heard of anyone else who has. Maybe I imagined it. My mother, Rose Sullivan, always said, quote, Every time I see a sunset, it reminds me of the circus fire. My dad never said a word about it. Unfortunately, he died five years later, and I never had a chance to talk to him about that day. Dennis Sullivan. It would be 1948 before the circus returned to the Hartford area, but this time they would make improvements to make the circus much safer than it had been in 1944. They changed the material for the Big Top itself, now both waterproof and fire-resistant. Animals, instead of using the chutes that blocked so many people's egress, were brought into the performance via rolling cages instead. More exits were also added. Another massive improvement was the new staircases that connected to the top of each bleacher section, enabling spectators to escape without ever setting foot in the arena inside. They also had fire equipment, including pumping trucks and hoses on hand to provide an immediate response should a fire occur. In 1956, the circus would retire its big top permanently, instead opting to perform in indoor arenas with seating. As a kid, I saw the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus perform in a local arena. My favorite parts were always the trapeze artists and the tightrope acts. I really didn't like the three ring format because I wanted to watch everything and I found my eyes darting from ring to ring in hopes of not missing a single moment of each performance. Tales of Insanity and Heroism Will Lee Curley Jr. and his son David went to the circus that day and escaped the fire. However, noticing all the people in need, Will instructed his son to wait for him by the car while he went back inside the burning tent to help others. Witnesses said that William helped people over the animal chutes while the canvas roof and supporting pole collapsed on him. Gosh, that is so sad. But bless him for helping all the people he did. He's a true hero, like literally runs inside burning buildings to save people. 
Frank Benson Bradley and his wife Alice escaped unharmed, but then ran back inside the burning tent to find their daughters and were ultimately found dead at the site. Their children had already escaped. It must have been insanity that gripped them, fearing for their children's lives, willing to risk their own to save them. But life tip, not a good idea to rush back in. I realize I said just the opposite about Will Curley Jr., but I feel his self-sacrifice in staying put at animal shoots, helping many people, strangers get over them, outweighs running around randomly in a dark and smoke-filled tent to hunt for your own offspring amongst thousands of people. Arlene escaped the tent quickly, and afterwards her parents shielded her from the news, preventing her from realizing the full nature of the disaster. Arlene credits this with giving her a better perspective on the fire, not having nightmares or obsessing over it. It has affected her in some ways, though. She's been to a couple more circuses in her lifetime, but says she never really enjoyed herself. And whenever she goes to a large venue, she checks where the exits are before taking her seat. That sounds like very practical and safe advice. I have a mountain of questions for you now, so please write in because I'm curious what you think. Who do you think Little Miss 1565 is? Do you believe she's Eleanor Cook? Or do you believe the graveside notes saying she was Sarah Graham? Or was she denied by her own father, unwilling to accept she was dead? Do you think that Officer Lowe actually found out who she was? And will that family ever come forward to relieve us of the mystery? Also, do you believe that Robert C.G. was innocent as he claims? Or do you think he set the fire in the circus that day? That's the end of our history today. If you got something out of today's episode, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you enjoyed this video, please activate the like button and consider leaving a comment. Both help us grow the channel so we can offer you more histories in this format. If you want to get in touch with me, write to me at the email on the about page or ping me on Discord. And remember to subscribe to our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. If you're consuming this episode as a podcast, we'd be very thankful if you left a review since that raises our ratings on the podcast sites and helps people find us. As always, much love to our patrons. <laughs>